ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Dr. Joe McCord. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Um, two days ago, David called me and we talked a little bit about what I was going to say today. And we both agreed that many of you have heard me speak. Uh, some of you, maybe unfortunately, more than once. Um, and the presentation that I normally give describes uh, pro tandem in recent history. And I'm, I think many of you probably have the impression that this is something that popped up in the last couple of years, maybe in a backroom laboratory of a struggling little comp company trying to get off the ground. But in fact, uh, pro tandem has roots that go very deep and very broad as well. Uh, pro tandem is uh, the cutting edge of a big slice of science that has developed in the last 40 years. I was very fortunate to be at the beginning of that as a graduate student. Um, you saw in the wonderful video at the beginning that much of this focuses around an enzyme called superoxide dismutase, an enzyme I had the good fortune to discover as a, as a very young graduate student at Duke University. That was really the beginning of what has developed into a, a big segment of science called free radical biology. And what I want to try to do today is give you some sense of that history, uh, some sense of the number of people, the number of hardworking, brilliant scientists who have been involved in the development of that over this period of 40 years. And what you will see is that pro tandem is kind of the icing on that cake. It's where we are at the moment. It's cutting edge. I can't tell you where we will be in 20 years from now or 40 more years from now. But science moves slowly, deliberately, uh, positively. And I want you to see where you are in that big picture. <clears throat> what I'm going to outline for you is the sequence, uh, uh, this sequence of events, starting with the discovery of superoxide dismutase, and how step by step uh, science built, one step at a time, uh, to, to get us from that discovery to, to where we are today. And a number of very important things had to be in place. A number of things had to be aligned, and they are. Uh, even before superoxide dismutase was discovered, it was kind of officially discovered in 1969, 40 years ago. This is the man that taught me essentially everything I know about science, Erwin Friedovich, a professor of biochemistry at Duke University. And I entered his lab as a graduate student. He had actually been trained at Duke under Phil Handler, uh, his mentor. And the beginnings of this idea of free radical biology go back, in fact, 10 years before I entered the scene, uh, to 1958. This is one of the first papers published by Erwin Friedovich. It suggested uh, very tentatively that a free radical product derived from oxygen, the oxygen that we breathe, might be produced in a biological system. The proof wasn't there, really. And it wasn't very, uh, uh, even, it wasn't even taken notice of by most biochemists. But the seed sprouted, and it grew. In 1968, 69, when I had entered the laboratory as <laughs> that young, handsome devil there on the, on the right, Erwin <clears throat> um, and I had the pieces in place we realized that there was an enzyme in our bodies with the apparent sole function of catalyzing the dismutation, that means eliminating, a free radical derived from oxygen. Well, it was a solution in search of a problem because the field did not recognize that biological systems could make free radicals. Free radicals are a reactive class of compounds. They're toxic. They can kill cells. 
And so here we were saying there's an enzyme in every cell in our body that with incredible efficiency gets rid of these free radicals. And a, a, a few people really grasped the idea. There was a handful of, of biochemists who saw the significance, who saw what this might mean. There were many more who sat there with uh, uh, their mouths hanging open a little bit that these people had the audacity to suggest that there was an enzyme that could get rid of free radicals. It was, it was a bit revolutionary at the time, but it was the first step. I remember specifically the day, this was actually the, the biggest eureka moment in this whole sequence. Scientists don't often have eureka moments. People think you run out of the lab every day with a test tube shouting, eureka, I dis <laughs> discovered something new. They're few and far between. <laughs> but, but this one did, did have such a moment. And uh, I had had the idea of how to really prove this thing. I won't go into the details. Uh, I did an experiment that took a couple of days to do. And I had only hinted to my professor uh, what I was about to make sure I was on the right track. I took the data into him on April 4th, 1968. It went in his office, and it was essentially the data shown here. Um, and when I handed him the data, uh, he, within seconds, grasped what it meant. And his expression, <laughs> was a holy cow, it's a superoxide dismutase. <laughs> and it, 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 I'm, uh, I'm extensively <laughs> paraphrasing what he said. <laughs> it, it had a little something to do with a cow, but that wasn't the exact um, expression. But, but that was the beginning. We realized that something big had just happened. We had no idea where it would go. We had no idea it was involved in any disease state, any pathological state. All we knew was this was a real curiosity. And we defined exactly what reaction this enzyme catalyzed. And so the science was, was on its way. And a lot of the, uh, our peers said, okay, there's an enzyme that eliminates the superoxide radical, but why? As I said, they, they didn't accept that the radical was even produced. One of the first jobs we had was to, I had discovered this in, in an isolate from bovine red blood cells. And so the question was, is this some quirk? Is it only found in bovine red blood cells or is it other places? And so in a laboratory full of students, we began looking in other places, and it was everywhere. Um, it was in red blood cells, it was in ma mice and rats and other species, it was in humans. We had one uh, student in the lab at the time who was a gardener, it was April, so he was starting to grow vegetables as the summer pr progressed. Every day, Chuck would come in with a new vegetable, putting it in the blender, and sure enough, there was superoxide dismutase, and tomatoes and zucchinis and, and so forth. I lost my hair. Also in, in more primitive organisms, yeast, and in fact E. coli, a single-celled bacterium. So all the way from human brain to E. coli, a bacterium, this enzyme was present at remarkably constant levels. What was that telling us? Well, the free radical that it eliminates is derived from oxygen, and almost every life form on this planet lives in oxygen, depends on oxygen. We breathe it, we metabolize it, we use it to burn our food, and that's what we have in common with all these life forms. Our metabolism in terms of burning food is remarkably similar across the spectrum. There are some life forms that can't grow in oxygen, some of the nastiest life forms, uh, the, the bacterium that causes botulism, for example, uh, is an anaerobe. It has a metabolism very different from ours, and not only does it not use oxygen, it dies in oxygen. Those organisms did not contain superoxide dismutase. So what we were left with was, indeed, this enzyme was uniformly distributed and 
present in every life form we could find that depended upon oxygen. So that suggested that indeed free radicals are made in every oxygen metabolizing organism. So then the question be became, is its function to protect those organisms? And indeed that was shown, this was a paper in 1971 uh, where we surveyed organisms. It turns out that there are some organisms that don't really metabolize oxygen, but aren't killed by it. They can grow in it. They just don't use it for much of anything. They had superoxide dismutase because they lived in oxygen. Only the ones that were killed by oxygen had no superoxide dismutase. Uh, this was amplified by uh, a brilliant scientist in, in France. This is work uh, 15 years later when biological techniques had evolved. Biology and, and biochemistry are dependent upon the techniques and often that's what's limiting. So you might want to do an experiment. Let's say, can we eliminate superoxide dismutase from E. coli and see what happens? We had crude uh, ways of doing that early on. This scientist had elegant ways 15 years later. And so she, she showed that if you take away the superoxide dismutase from E. coli, it can only grow without oxygen. E. coli is one of those organisms that can grow with or without oxygen. It kind of has two sets of metabolism. And furthermore, she showed if she took away the E. coli's own superoxide dismutase and it became a strict anaerobe, couldn't grow in air anymore, she could put the human gene for superoxide dismutase into that E. coli and it would restore its function. It could then grow in oxygen once again. So it became very clear that superoxide dismutase was essential for growing in oxygen. And the reason is if you use oxygen, you make free radicals from it and you need an enzyme to protect you from those free radicals. The next step uh, that uh, the next question that, that biologists ask uh, when they're going through this, uh, this process is if you have an enzyme, you know it's important, what happens if that enzyme is lost or part of the activity is diminished? Does a disease result from it? And many of the genetic diseases that we have uh, are the result of insufficiency of one of these enzymes that's essential uh, to larger or greater, uh, to lesser extent, uh, for life processes. There were some clues right up front that there was a connection between superoxide dismutase, SOD, and other processes involved in disease. And it came in a very unusual, bizarre way, before we even discovered superoxide dismutase, a couple of scientists up the coast a few hundred miles here in California, in Mountain View, were running a little company called Diagnostic Data. And they had discovered, uh, one was a urologist in San Francisco, the other a biochemist. They had discovered a protein from bovine liver that had powerful anti-inflammatory activity. And they had isolated this protein on the basis of that anti-inflammatory activity and then started a little pharmaceutical company called Diagnostic Data Incorporated to develop and they hoped to get approval for this as a drug to treat inflammation. And here are a couple of papers uh, among the earliest ones that they published, actually not the earliest, but uh, and they called this protein orgotine. And it was used uh, to treat inflammation in horses, actually in very expensive racehorses that have problems with inflammation in their ankles because of the, the trauma and uh, the stress on those joints. And they had gone through safety tests and they were in the process of actually getting FDA approval for this protein as an anti-inflammatory protein. When we published our description of superoxide dismutase in 1969, it has some very unique biochemical properties. They saw our publication in the Journal of Biological Chemistry and compared it to the protein they had been studying for about five years, orgotine, and instantly realized these were the same protein because they had the same characteristics, the same copper content, the same spectrum. 
And so the identity was confirmed. We, they contacted me. We swapped samples, and uh, sure enough, orgotine, anti-inflammatory protein, was superoxide dismutase. And so a, a huge question was, how are these things connected? Because it wasn't at all clear why getting rid of this free radical that people were reluctant to even accept um, had something to do with a basic process in, uh, taking place in all of our bodies, a disease process, inflammation. And the answer to that came from another wonderful scientist who unfortunately passed away about five years ago. Uh, also here in California, at the University of uh, California, San Diego, uh, and at Scripps in, uh, in La Jolla, just up the road. Bernie Baby Orr discovered in 1974 that activated white blood cells, these are the cells that handle inflammation in your body, they also handle getting rid of microbes in your body, keeping your body free of infection. These cells made superoxide radical. They made a lot of it. And what occurred to Bernie and what turned out to be absolutely true is these white blood cells make this reactive chemical in order to kill invading microorganisms. This is the phenomenon I've referred to. Someone reminded me last night uh, of Mother Nature making a silk purse from a sow's ear. Uh, or if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. This free radical that most of our cells were trying to avoid making had been put to good use by some very important cells in your body, the white blood cells that keep you free of infection. And so when those white blood cells encounter a microbe, a virus, a bacterium, they eat it like an amoeba eats something smaller than itself. They flow around it, engulf it, and they bombard it with this free radical. Well, the very process that keeps you free from infection also causes some problems for you because we have diseases that are autoimmune diseases. Rheumatoid arthritis is maybe the best known of those. What happens in rheumatoid arthritis? The white blood cells get their wires crossed a little bit. Their job is to, to figure out what's part of you and what's not part of you. If they see something that isn't you, isn't self, they kill it because they assume it's an invading microorganism, a virus, a bacterium. Because there are lots of parts of you to keep, keep track of, we have autoimmune diseases when these cells get confused, they make mistakes. They see the lining of the joints in your body and they think, I don't recognize that as self, I'm gonna attack it and kill it. And they try to kill a specific part of your body by bombarding it with the weapon that they have, that is superoxide radical, that they use in other situations to kill microbes. Now it's directed at the lining of your joint. So you can see there's a crossover between immunity, keeping your body free of invading microbes, and inflammation, which is what happens when these wires get crossed a little bit and the artillery is directed not at the invader, but rather at self. This was an absolutely uh, key uh, uh, recognition by Bernie. I immediately did a, stu <clears throat> a study. Bernie was considered with the immunity part of it. I wanted to show uh, the inflammation part of it. And so I showed in this very brief uh, study published in the journal Science that superoxide radical could degrade the synovial fluid in, the, in your joints. The synovial fluid is like grease in, a, in a, a joint in your automobile. It lubricates it, it allows the joints to move. It's essential for their function. When you have an inflamed joint, if you have an arthritic joint, that synovial fluid is broken down. What I showed is that the superoxide free radical made by these white blood cells could break it down and the SOD could prevent it. It could protect that synovial fluid from being broken down. So pieces of the puzzle started to fit together. Um, subsequent publication, again, I'm not gonna go into detail with, with these, but showed other functions uh, of this interface between immunity and inflammation with superoxide being right there in the middle of that intersection. 
bigger diseases and uh, uh, started to fall into place, uh, notably cancer. One of the primary causes of death in the United States. And this was uh, studied first by uh, another scientist, Larry Oberly, who also recently passed away of, of uh, uh, renal disease that he had suffered with his entire life. Larry published a paper in 1979 uh, with this title, Role of Superoxide Dismutase in Cancer, a review, and that got some attention. Uh, one of the, the sentences in the abstract, the first sentence there, lowered amounts of copper zinc containing superoxide dismutase have been found in many, but not all, tumors. And that was the basis. This has been studied uh, for another 20 years by Larry and, and by many other scientists. And so suddenly this free radical was now at the center of a major class of diseases, cancer. This is a remarkable paper uh, published by Larry in 1993. Increased manganese SOD expression, that is if cells are induced to make more SOD, suppresses the malignant phenotype of human melanoma cells. What that means is human melanoma cells are, melanoma is a de the deadliest kind of skin cancer. And Larry grew these human melanoma skin cancer cells and with genetic techniques, molecular biological techniques, was able to cause them to make more SOD. And what he saw is they lost their cancer characteristics completely. They reverted to normal looking cells just by making more SOD. All right, so again, superoxide dismutase at the interface of this hugely important disease process. And it didn't end there. Disease is actually the primary uh, killer of Americans is heart disease. And heart disease is, uh, it does involve some inflammation. Many diseases involve inflammation, but it has another mechanism altogether different. You hear about blood clots forming in coronary arteries. That's what we're all terrified of. When that happens, the blood supply, the oxygen supply to the heart muscle is temporarily interrupted, at least to a portion of the heart muscle. And oxygen is cut off from that muscle. What uh, physicians try to do, what, if you're rushed to an emergency room, the first thing is to restore the blood flow as soon as possible to get that tissue oxygenated again so it can keep, keep functioning. When oxygen returns to that tissue after a period of absence, a burst of free radicals are produced. And this, uh, this came from studies uh, with a dear friend and collaborator, Neil Granger, who's now chairman of the Department of Physiology at Louisiana State University. We did these experiments in 1981. Um, not with great foresight. Again, often uh, experiments are kind of stumbled across and this was no exception. And the, the model was not heart. The, the big organs that suffer from ischemic injury are heart when you have a heart attack and brain when you have a stroke. And the, the mechanism is almost the same, it's just the organ is different. Uh, Neil was studying intestinal ischemia, which again is a, is a big problem. Any organ in your body can be uh, affected by this kind of injury. Uh, we discovered a mechanism uh, whereby the deprivation of oxygen and its reintroduction gives rise to superoxide radical. We published that, and it was quickly picked up by uh, others in the area. Uh, let me skip that one. Oh, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, in a moment. An another huge disease uh, that isn't really a disease at all. In fact, the FDA doesn't recognize aging as a disease. And in, in the end, it's kind of the disease that gets all of us. Um, <laughs> it's, it's fortunate in a way that it's not viewed as a disease. This is a scientist who was at the National Institute 
uh, on aging in uh, Baltimore, Maryland uh, for many years and published a truly remarkable study in 1980. Uh, Dick Cutler uh, had the idea that, that superoxide dismutase would fit right into actually a, a pre-existing theory called the free radical theory of, of aging a theory that aging is the result of accumulated damage done largely by free radicals resulting from oxidative metabolism. And uh, Dr. Cutler measured the amount of SOD in the livers of about a dozen different species. Some of these species live only a few years, some of them live 10 or 20 years, some of them live like humans, uh, maybe 80 years. And it turns out that lifespan of those species was not directly related just to superoxide dismutase content, but when he measured the metabolic rate of their liver, that is, he, he had two parameters. One, how much free radical protection is there in the liver, how much SOD. The other parameter, how much oxygen is that liver burning? What's the rate of oxygen consumption in the liver? And so that's what determines how many free radicals are made and the other part of the equation is how much superoxide dismutase is there to get rid of those free radicals. When he looked at that ratio in various species, he saw a linear relationship. That ratio increased with the longevity, the mean life expectancy of the species. So organisms that, regardless of how much oxygen their liver consumed and how much free radical they made, if they had an abundance of SOD, they lived a long time. If they had a paucity of SOD, not much of it, they had very short lifespans. That got the attention, again, of a huge segment of science, the people, the gerontologists, people interested in aging. It led to papers like this, again, using cutting edge molecular biology techniques. Uh, Raj Sohal uh, in Dallas showed that he could introduce extra copies of the superoxide dismutase gene into a primitive life form, fruit flies, and they would live 30% longer. So what he was doing was modifying this ratio that Dr. Cutler had found, more SOD with a given constant amount of, of free radical production would increase the lifespan of an organism. Even more dramatically, this has been shown in mice. This was uh, four years ago in the journal Science. Really the same experiment. Scientists introduced additional copies of a gene that led to more catalase, a different antioxidant enzyme, in the mitochondria of mice. And the mice lived about 25% longer. So again, here's superoxide dismutase, here's this free radical at the very interface of longevity, as well as the diseases I mentioned, the huge ones heart disease, cancer, um, uh, inflammatory diseases. Well, once scientists recognize that indeed uh, a process is involved uh, in diseases, the next question is, can they be fixed? Can you manipulate somehow this information and alleviate some of the processes either that cause disease or accompany disease? And in the case of free radical biology, uh, SOD was kind of the focus. Um, I've talked only about SOD, briefly about catalase up to this point. And a point I'm gonna be making soon is that they are not alone. Your body has a whole battery of antioxidant enzymes. They are two of the ones that were studied most intensely in the beginning, but by no means the whole solution. But when scientists began to say, can this SOD become a drug? Can it be used? Uh, papers began to appear like these two. One in circulation research, and I'll kind of translate the titles here for you, canine myocardial reperfusion injury. This is a, a model in a dog of a heart attack. And when a heart attack occurs, there's an area of the heart that's affected that essentially can die. Um, 
reducing the function of the heart. It has a big dead patch uh, on the side of a, a ventricle in the heart. You can't pump blood anymore. That infarct, which is the mass of tissue that dies, was reduced by the administration of superoxide dismutase and catalase. So that here, using these two enzymes as drugs in a laboratory model of a heart attack, indeed, they reduced the effect of the heart attack. The second paper is very similar, um, using catalase alone to reduce the size of an infarct in a pig model, porcine model uh, of ischemia reperfusion. Papers like this began to appear in many labs around the country country. My own lab was, was doing similar things, and maybe at least a dozen other laboratories. In, <clears throat> in the fall of 1986, the American Heart Association ha held its annual meeting in Dallas. There was a session uh, where paper after paper of exactly this kind of study w was presented. In attendance at that Heart Association meeting was a, a science reporter from the Wall Street Journal. They cover those meetings because they're always looking for new, new information about new drugs and new studies. Uh, the, the Wall Street Journal reporter was named Jerry Bishop, and he had stumbled into this session. He said there were 24 concurrent sessions at this meeting, and probably hundreds and hundreds of studies being presented, usually 15 minutes at a time. And in this session, he heard paper after paper talking about superoxide dismutase reducing infarct size after heart attack. And he said, what is this superoxide dismutase? So he went back to the Wall Street Journal, and he started digging around and that digging led him to me because I was the guy who discovered this enzyme. And so uh, he attended a meeting again just up the road in La Jolla on the UCSD campus there, uh, a meeting about oxidative stress. He was in attendance and he said, can we go outside? I'd like to interview you. I'm from the Wall Street Journal. And so he did. We talked for probably an hour or so under a tree in that beautiful setting. And a couple of days later, a front page story appeared on the Wall Street Journal. A tale from the lab. <laughs> a long winding course of medical research leads to a breakthrough. Well, he wrote this um, because he had attended that session at the American Heart Association. He wanted to figure out what is this about and he did a really interesting uh, story, tracing this back through many of my colleagues who were quoted in the story. And this got the attention of the media in a big way. Scientists don't usually force themselves onto the medium. They wait, the media, they wait until their, their science is discovered in meetings such as the American Heart Association. When, uh, the Wall Street Journal publishes a front page story about something. It's only a matter of time. In fact, it was only two days until the really major media discovered it. I was in Mobile, Alabama at the time, and so the next day I was on the front page of the Mobile Press and the Mobile Register, the two newspapers serving uh, that rather small city. Uh, I had my first press conference. Uh, the guy there on my right is the president of the University of South Alabama, who is now my best friend. <laughs> uh, and, and so uh, the, the press realized this, and in fact, the Wall Street Journal had called it a medical breakthrough. It wasn't quite that yet because there were still steps to be made. And in fact, those steps turned out to be difficult. Often things work really well in a lab, they don't translate well uh, when you try to turn them into a drug or turn them into uh, human uh, clinical medicine. And such was the case with SOD. The, the desire was there, let's cash in on this enzyme's ability to protect us from free radicals that are caused in cancer, heart disease, stroke, all of those diseases. Still stumbling blocks. Many laboratories were trying to create drugs either using SOD itself as a drug, and enzymes make terrible drugs. They're expensive to produce. You ha often have immune responses. If it's a bovine enzyme, it's a foreign protein. You have an allergic response to it. 
um, all kinds of problems with converting enzymes into drugs. My lab took an approach of making it a better behaved drug. We genetically modified human superoxide dismutase, actually putting two genes together to try to get the best properties of, of both. Others took uh, different effects. Um, creation of compounds that have synthetic compounds, drugs, that have SOD-like activity was a major uh, thrust. Uh, Dr. James Crapo, who serves on our board of directors and who was a friend and colleague of mine going back to uh, the early 1970s, has been instrumental uh, over, over several decades trying to create drugs that have SOD-like activity. Uh, again, in the laboratory, sometimes the results are dramatic, but this has still not made that transition into human uh, clinical medicine and human uh, uh, disease uh, prevention or treatment, but that, that continues. There are times when you need SOD activity acutely. Uh, following a myocardial in, infarct is one of those times, and so there is a real need for a drug that's injectable, synthetic, uh, something that could be made by Merck or Pfizer that would provide SOD activity. I mentioned that SOD and catalase uh, are not the only players here. This is a slide that shows you the system of antioxidant enzymes. Everything shown in blue is an antioxidant enzyme. And if you look uh, there, you'll see SOD1, SOD2, catalase. But there are lots of other enzymes uh, that you may not recognize. They're not as well known. And this is the system our bodies use to maintain control over oxidative processes things that begin with free radical biology, free radical reactions. Um, so when you look at this picture, you say, well, you know, it would be, if we had a drug that had SOD activity, that might help because that's sort of at the beginning of this chain of events, but clearly it's not the whole picture. How wonderful it might be if we had a way of not just in increasing SOD or just catalase, but that whole network of enzymes that our bodies use to control oxidative stress. And this is where protandum starts to enter the picture. And this is very late. I described so far about 35 years of science for you. And, and protandum came along five years ago at the very end of this sequence of events. And you, you might say, why did it wait that long? It's because we didn't understand how these enzymes were regulated. We didn't know how the body knew uh, when to upregulate these. We didn't know the mechanisms that could be tweaked to cause the body to upregulate these enzymes. But that was now the question. So I, I've taken you uh, actually into the 21st century. And that's, that's where uh, this issue suddenly becomes very attractive. And five years ago, uh, two of the founders of a company called Lifeline Therapeutics that is now known as LifeVantage came to my office and their idea was, um, can we put together a laundry list of antioxidant kinds of compounds that could upregulate this entire family of enzymes? And the answer was uh, yes, or at least maybe. Uh, what I was presented with was a, a list of 41 potential ingredients for a product they wanted to call Protandum. And I went through the list and penciled out rapidly about uh, 36 of those ingredients because they were either not of interest or, or not likely to be effective. What I was left with was five botanicals. And the reason these were chosen is they had all had published science behind them showing that they might be able to induce at least SOD and catalase. And we put them together, we tested it in mice, and indeed it did work. Um, what I'm eliminating here is a lot of the work that I've described and many of you have heard, uh, heard me talk about before, but I'll come to this. This is how these active ingredients in protandum address this problem of oxidative stress. In the upper right there is something called a NERF2 activator. That's a molecule 
of one of these active ingredients in protandum. The way that all five of them work is they activate a factor called NERF2 in the cell. How do they do it? When you ingest protandum, it finds its way to receptors on the surface of a cell. The big green oval is a human cell. And one of these protandum ingredients binds. It sends a signal across the cell membrane through a kinase into the cell. It modifies chemically that little red protein labeled NERF2, putting a phosphate group on. The protein is liberated by this blue protein that's been holding it in the cell cytosol, releasing it so that the little red protein can find its way into the cell nucleus, where the DNA resides. It binds to a segment called the antioxidant response element, a sequence of DNA common to all of those blue enzymes I showed you in that network of, of enzymes. That's the switch. The antioxidant response element is the switch on the DNA that says, express this gene, make, make its gene product. The whole family of antioxidant enzymes is then expressed in the cell. The concentration is elevated, and that cell now has greatly increased protection from oxidative stress. We published this uh, in 2006. Many of you have seen this. This is a measure of oxidative stress in our human clinical trial where we tested these five ingredients in humans to see if indeed it could lower oxidative stress. Many of the participants in this trial were taking conventional direct antioxidants, vitamin E, vitamin C, the blue dots. And as you can see, those direct antioxidants were not decreasing oxidative stress with age. In fact, if you draw a line just through those dots, you see that, that, in fact, oxidative stress was higher in the people taking direct antioxidants, vitamin E, vitamin C. What happened to these same people when they took the five ingredients in protandum, they took the commercial product, protandum, for 30 days? And these are the, the results from those same people. So the 80-year-old on the extreme right, uh, you can see had a high level of about three before protandum, reduced to one after protandum. And in fact, if we get rid of the old data and now just look at these people ranging in age from 20 to 80 years old, what you can see is that the um, increase in oxidative stress previously seen with age has been completely eliminated. And looking at this parameter in their blood samples, I cannot now tell you who's 80 years old and who's 20 years old, because they all look the same. After 120 days, this was maintained. <clears throat> and the reason uh, the oxidative stress decreased is because these two important antioxidant enzymes were, in fact, increased in the blood of these individuals. So the, all of that 35 years of previous data I showed you where scientists have struggled with ways of getting SOD into an organism in a laboratory, couldn't do it in a clinic. Um, this pill, with these five active ingredients, sends a signal to the cell. It, it, rather than trying to put in SOD and catalase, it's telling the cell, make more SOD and catalase. The cells respond, and so your entire natural antioxidant network is increased as a result of this signal to your cell's DNA. A uh, paper published only a couple of months ago says why the formula, why protandum is special. There is synergy among these five. If you look at the five individual ingredients, you can see here looking at one antioxidant enzyme, heme oxygenase. Not one of the five has a substantial ability to induce this enzyme on, it, on their own. But the five together produce an 18-fold increase in that enzyme. All right, synergy is defined as uh, a result that exceeds the sum of the individual parts. And that uh, uniqueness to the protandum composition has resulted in the issuance of U.S. patent. The composition is protected. It can't be knocked off. And it does some really remarkable things. In this 40-year period, more than 60,000 scientific papers have been published. Again, to give you an idea 
of the magnitudes, probably more than half a million pages of published uh, studies showing the various roles of superoxide uh, in more than 100 human diseases, some say 200. And you can see that protandum entered this picture in, in the year 2005, um, 2004, which is really the end of, of this. That's why I referred to it in the beginning as the icing on the cake. This is where the, the field is. This is the culmination of molecular biology that tells us how this thing works. And these are universities uh, and listed here in the top where I have colleagues who have said, send me some protanum. What a remarkable tool for me to use in studying uh, oxidative stress and continuing this 40, 40 years of, of progress. And the list of diseases at the bottom uh, being studied as diseases of oxidative uh, stress is an amazing spectrum. And I'm going to end there and thank you very much for your attention and, and thank you for being a part of this. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.